<laughs> now then, guys, welcome to the Cycle Sunday podcast. Hey, chick, chick. Dude, <laughs> there's red ice cubes. Yeah, maybe. I got these when I did the, during lockdown, Audi launched the e-tron GT and we had an online launch and we drank lots and lots of gin and tonic. In fact, my mate, Tom <laughs> Howard, the gentleman racer, drank a whole bottle of gin on the launch. I thought you'd like those. Ching. But for those of you who are watching on YouTube, the cool thing is we're together. You can we're, here. we're here. The what? petrol pups are here. <laughs> We've got gin and tonic with red ice cubes in it. Flashing ice cubes. Oh, that's right. I thought this one, had, I thought, I thought this one was broken. <laughs> <laughs> the winter flash. So what on earth's happening? Well, you're down south, mate. Sorry, I'm, I'm completely <laughs> lost the flow. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers yeah. to all of you. Right. So, pull yourself together. Welcome, an, everybody. An unusual podcast in that this is the first podcast. Now, if you listened last week, we did give you a heads up that this was going to happen, that we were going to be able to film the podcast um, in person rather than online. Uh, this is what happens when you don't... When you, oh. So, the petrol pup is currently <laughs> being very demanding. Yes. So, yeah, so... You are down to, you're delivering bikes. Yes, I was delivering bikes down south. Down south? Yeah, and um, and I was within two and a half hours away of you. Now, I love the way he says, he goes, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just, I've got to deliver a bike in Bristol and a bike in Bath, and then I can come and pop over. I'm like, Paul, it's two and a half hours away. <laughs> but the thing is, you've got to take everything in context. Yeah. So two and a half hours from sort of Bath, Bristol. Sorry, for those of you who are listening in the car at the moment, the petrol pup is now sort Being of like, very, very demanding. Is now is is now getting very cuddly. Oh, hold on a minute. Yes. So, um, so I'm literally um, within sort of two and a half. Oh, we've got we've got two now. Yeah, okay. we've got them both now. We've got them both, and they're both absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Any, anybody who's who has never met the petrol pups, who have just seen them on the um, on 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 the telly box, they are the softest, cutest, most gorgeous things in the world. So uh, Rosie's not going to be very happy. Is no, she? Rosie's not going to be very happy. Rosie is my wife and um, and she's not going to be very happy because she really, really wants to be here right now, but can't because she's, uh, she's got a proper job. Yeah. Yeah. But that is a segue yes. into the video yes. that dropped. Yes. Last week. Yes. All about um, Tracy's bike. Yes. Starring your lovely wife, Rosie, starring my wife, Tracy. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and it's had amazing feedback. It's had really good feedback. And the thing that I've really enjoyed about um, the comments, again, thank you so much to everybody because the comments for both the podcast and also the uh, video that dropped yeah. were just lovely. I yeah, mean, yeah. just genuinely lovely. So uh, well done. Um, but yeah, there's, there's been a few folk who have been commenting how they, they actually appreciate that we love us enjoying our hobby with our wives. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know for some people, Cycling is an escape from their other half. <laughs> yes. And to be quite honest, my I love, if I've had a bad week, I love nothing more than going out on a bike. Yeah. And just, just, you just kind of unpack the week, stick it to one side and enjoy being out on your bike. Yes. And it's great being, you know, you time. However, it's also amazing when you can go out and spend some time with, with, with your missus. Yeah, that's um, true. Yeah. Um, and we, we love going out. We don't do as often as we should, but now we've got the e-bike sorted. Yes, and hopefully, hopefully we will. Yes. So, yeah, um, it's it's great to have a hobby that you can share. Yes. <laughs> so we are only laughing because um, <laughs> because um, sorry, is this one Darcy? No, that's Hallie. Oh, that's Hallie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hall, Hallie is, is 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 being very familiar. Yes, with me at the moment. Yes. <laughs> So yes. anyway, so that was last week. Yes. Tonight's video dropped because yes. what's throwing us a little bit is I haven't even edited the video. We're filming this uh, on, what day is it today? Monday. November. Monday. November. Yeah, Monday. <laughs> so yeah, it's, so um, it's it's we're actually being very well organized. We are. We're well ahead of time, yes. which is unusual for us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, to, so tonight's video is all about the gravel bike. And what we thought we'd have a chat about is firstly kind of just summarize some of the key points of the video around gravel but also um there's a kind of link into that um around winter bikes and stuff yes so, yes 
I thought it might be useful. Hopefully, you've all watched the video, uh, my little trip to the Cotswold. By the way, Cotswold's a stunning area to do cycling. It's beautiful. It's pretty, pretty hilly. Yes. It's not as hilly maybe as somewhere like the Peaks or... Um, you're getting some. You, yes. You're not. You're not giving her any. Oh, love. oh, sorry. Right, sorry. You, you, you've got to stroke yeah. both dogs. Apparently, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Paul's okay. dog wrangling at the moment. Yes, um, but it's a beautiful part of the world. And, yes. and what was fascinating about that bike ride is Dino, who was um, you know on on the ride with me, he he'd never really done a great deal of long distance riding on a CX or gravel bike. Okay. He borrowed, <laughs> borrowed a bike from his from, from his eldest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when I when I put the idea because uh, he's a the original plan was we were going to go on mountain bike. Yeah. And I said, no, I really want to take this new, this new Architex and find a, find a CX bike. And he was like, oh, okay. Mm. And he really, really enjoyed it. Right. And w what we really enjoyed was the fact that in the, in the duration of the ride, which was, as you'll have seen in the video, a little bit longer than we planned, mm. we did quite a lot of tarmac yeah. and quite a bit of gravel and quite a bit of grass. Right. And, and I can't imagine doing that ride on anything other than a gravel bike. Sure. Well, road bike, you couldn't have done it anyway, because the no. the grass you might have got away with on a, on a bad day, but let's face it, you don't really want to do that. And, no. and the gravel was definitely too too gnarly for a road bike. Yes. A mountain bike would have been fine. Yeah. A hardtail one probably better than a softtail one, but there was quite a lot of road work, and I hate riding my mountain bike on the road. Right, it's just geared wrong. It's horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's geared wrong. So what... What does Dino, what, what discipline does he normally ride? Is he almost exclusively a mountain biker or does no, he do a bit, road? No, a bit of both. Right. Yeah. So, so he's used to doing road, road and he's and used, bike. but he's, he's never really, because his son races at a high level cyclocross. Yeah, yeah. But does, as, as. Dino's a mechanic. Dino's a mechanic, <laughs> right, okay. He goes right. along and fixes the bike and gets it ready and stuff. Right. But no, they go, there's down near there where there's a place called Queen Elizabeth Country Park, which is. He's got like a bike park and stuff there, so they go there with the mountain bikes, right. and then they do a bit. Of, he does a bit of bit of road cycling in the summer, right? Um, but, but no, we just never really combine the two. No, no and okay. I think it's the longest he's ever sat on a cyclocross bike. To wow. be honest, so. Okay, uh, but it was just I, I just found it, and and my whole time with that um, Archidex so far is what I love about it is is it's like you know three rides in one. Yes, you know you've got you've got it's fine on a road. Yeah, yes, it's compromised. At the top end of your gears because of the way the way it's geared, but yeah. I'm not I'm not normally going that fast anyway. But we'll also talk two by one by yeah, pros yeah. cons as yeah, well yeah, in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could change the gearing, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then when you go off on on, on road, the the uphill side of things, you I just absolutely destroy. When I first got it, I went out and did some of my kind of trails around here, and yeah. just all my uphill climbs just destroyed them on Strava. That you'd normally do on your mountain bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like by, you know, we're not talking a small amount. We're talking 25% quicker, probably. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, and although it's <laughs> slight, slight aside, I then did the same route recently on my Eve mountain bike. Okay. Um, and when I uploaded it to Strava, Strava actually came up and went, it looks like this bike rides on an e-bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like... Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you flag it as an e-bike? Yeah, right? I did then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but no, so uphill-wise, I found that the, the, the gravel bike's great. Where, but but again, sometimes, you know, it's not quite as low. My granny gear isn't as low as my mountain bike would be. No. Um, so you do have to, you have to work hard on some of the steeper climbs. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Um, the, the bit that sometimes I find it, not compromise is the wrong word, but when you think, I wish I was on my mountain bike, is on the faster descents where either it's rougher or where you've got tracks because it tends, because it's got quite narrow wheels, it tends to track into things and you just have to be a little bit more cautious, or I do anyway, because of my lack of skill. Just let off the brakes and shut your eyes. That's what I do. Yeah, I know, but I'm not that, I'm not that, you know, I don't shred gnar oh, right. as well as you, mate. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, uh, but I love it. I, I absolutely yeah. love it. And, and you know, you can go out and, and it's a real multi-purpose bike. And I know we've called it the kind of SUV of the bike world. But yes. But where I thought we'd go with this um, chat is the is the movement now, because it's obviously come into winter. Yes. I've got the old tray, which, to be honest, I, I can't see myself riding that much. Yeah, it was funny. The weekend it was really sunny and quite dry, and I, for a moment, I thought, "Oh, I might go out on the old tray," and then just thought, "Well, there's a lot of salt in the roads." Yeah, you know, I, I would get, 
I, I, this makes me sound like a real prima donna. If I went down into a dip and there was like w- water or mud on the road, I'd get I'd get really stressed. Right, so okay. I'm just going to probably not ride that bike so much during the winter. But the architects, yes, I can see that being written quite a lot in the winter. Yes, um, yeah. and it kind of makes a, a really good winter bike. So what we thought we we were having a chat before we we did the podcast um, because we always try and think about new subjects that we haven't covered before Mm -hmm. we haven't really talked about winter bikes before i think we've mentioned them in joking in the past because for me a a, a winter bike is always just an excuse to buy a new summer bike (laughs) 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 so you know you get into the winter you take your summer bike you put a set of mug guards on it and maybe a set of tires with a bit more grip yeah and that's suddenly your winter bike yes and then when you get into the spring you're like well I need a new summer bike. Yes. Uh, because that's my winter bike now. <laughs> <laughs> Is that man maths? That's man maths oh, right there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well, well done. That, that's you playing N plus one yearly. I don't need to do N plus one anymore. I need to start doing N minus one because I've got, I've, I've got more, my bike collections like sh- the schmuseum of <laughs> bikes basically. Um, but on a serious note, yes. I, I can now see I, even my Venge, I don't really like riding out in the winter that much. I, I never no. rode it in the winter before no. because it's just too high end a bike. The, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, um, get it too muddy or salty and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'd either go mountain biking or I'd ride my old giant. Yes, the Architects now sits in that, and, and it's actually a very high end bike. It's it's a more valuable bike than my Specialized, but it's kind of designed to do that. Right? Yeah, and it doesn't feel like it, does it? No, no. It, it's like if you. Um... If you bought, you know, put it into car words, if you bought an Alpine A110, yeah, right, 50 grand, yeah, sports car, and you then bought a Range Rover, yeah, that's 70 grand, yeah, yeah, you'd still park your Range Rover in the shop's car park where you probably wouldn't park your Alpine, yeah, you'll take it on that sort of and I need to park and put the wheel up onto a verge yeah. in your 70 grand Range Rover, but you'd never think about doing that I with your Alpine. We, we had um, a discovery. We'd only had it not long, and it, it was in the winter, and I went into the Sainsbury's car park, and they'd been, um, they'd obviously had a snowplow in there, kind of clearing the snow out of the car park. There's yes. this big bank of snow in the corner. Yeah. So I parked the discovery on it. <laughs> so I'm just drove up. It's like, yes. But, but you, you know, Sorry, can I just also? Oh, this is terrible. This is like confessions of the oh, four wheel no. drive. Maybe we shouldn't do them together <laughs> with, with alcohol anymore. So, Richard has, um, my brother has got a um, Defender yeah. 110. And we decided to go up to the Isle of Skye and do a bit of walking up there. So, you know, a little bit sort of bonding and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, we went up in his Defender. Seriously, they're horrible, right? But yeah. he, but he loves it. So we got to Fort William, and we said, right, okay, we need to go into Never Sports, have a bit of breakfast, and and that sort of stuff. And there's a little car park, and it was really full. It was it was really busy, and we'd just gone round the corner and saw that basically a car was pulling out, and there was a curb that you could get up and over and drop into this space. And Richard just went, oh, there's a space. So literally drove up and over the curb <laughs> and then dropped into this space, into the car park. Yeah. And there was, and I'm really sorry, international people, yeah. but there was a German gentleman yes. in a German registered vehicle who had actually queued for the spectacle. Oh dear. <laughs> we dropped in and he wasn't particularly pleased. He wasn't happy. He wasn't that's, happy. You know, that's the whole point. Of that's the whole point. point. In fairness, we then left. Okay. Yeah. And so the gentleman <laughs> did get, but the irony really of sort of queuing up and we sort of like, we sort of barged in <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> was was for us quite funny um so yeah so that was uh, that was our little uh, four by four excursion but yeah the, the point is is that you know you can buy a gravel bike and it can be quite a hefty investment but at the same token 
you're right, you don't feel as precious about it. No. I don't feel as precious with my gravel bike. Yeah, I, I run it with carbon wheels. I run it with carbon handlebars, carbon stem, carbon seat post. Yeah. And this thing's quite high end. I've got a Trek checkpoint. Yeah. And that's quite a high end bike. Yeah. But you just don't feel precious about it. It feels hardcore. Yeah, it does. And, you know, and I think that for me, you know, I, I, the first time I went out and got it muddy, I, I, you know, I didn't come back and go, oh, my God. I just put the hose on it and cleaned it off and it was fine. Yes. Um, so I think that for me, the gravel bike wise, and, and the really cool thing, although I haven't got them on mind, and this is one of the things we were going to talk about, is that there's lots of options. If, if you wanted to put mud guards on, yeah. a lot of um, you know, uh, gravel bikes have attachments for yeah. mud guards. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, even um, my uh, the mud guards I had on my road bike, they weren't actually attached to any fixings. They had like little... Um, little attachments that rubber banded onto the floor yeah, and the so, seat stays so, and stuff. So, so, so like a, a race blade. Yeah, that, they were a race blade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. really good. They work great. They're um, really good. Yes. Um, so, you know, you can put mud guards on if you want. And, yeah. you know, one of the things we're going to talk about is is on a winter bike, what might you want to consider on a winter bike? Yeah, she, she's quite yes. cute, isn't she? Yes. Um, sorry, the petrol pup is again yes. uh, being very demonstrative. To yes, people. almost quite amorous. Yeah. yeah. Is, is you think, well... I don't want to have uh, mud guards on my road bike or my gravel bike. No. Well, you think that right up until it starts raining and then you've got race blades on or mud guards on and you don't get a wet bum. No. So, <laughs> it's mega. Yeah. And you don't spray the person behind you. Well, do you know, that that's, that's more the point. So if you're riding, particularly in winter, and you're a club rider, and you do ride in sort of a peloton of um, of riders. <laughs> Sorry, it's the dogs, I'm afraid. Um, what you'll find is that a lot of clubs will actually insist that when you get to a certain part of the year that you that you have a bike where you fit full length mud guards to it. Yeah. Um, because if you are riding in a group of people, I mean, um, even a even just a, a relatively thin road tire dispels quite a lot of water out the back uh, um, and can make it quite dangerous. So, yeah, some, sometimes on a, on a winter bike, having the ability to fit a full-length mud guard to it is, is a priority. Yeah. So that's number one. And therefore, you need a frame design that is, um, um, that is capable of taking a full-length mud guard with a reasonable size tyre as yeah. well. But if you're, say, riding on your own or you're just riding with a couple of people, what... Rosie and I do on our gravel bikes, we don't fit mud guards because the issue that you have with full length mud guards on a gravel bike is because the mud guard sits quite low mm. uh, to the tyre, uh, it, it, they, they can get clogged with mud. Uh, yeah. So they don't have a huge amount of mud clearance. But in addition to that, they can pick up small stones and get jammed in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the principal reason, when you're riding off-road, particularly if you've got relatively tight switchback-style riding, mm. the front mud guard, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, on a road-slash-gravel bike, you struggle with a, a, a thing called toe overlap, which is when you've got a mud guard fitted to the front wheel of the bike, no, you, I mean. you lose about two to three centimetres when your foot is out in the three o'clock position yeah, yeah. out front and you turn the handlebars relatively tightly, uh, you can get your foot jammed between the mud guard and the pedal stroke. Yeah. Now, normally on a, on a road ride, you never do that because you're putting, what, a maximum of seven to ten degrees of turn in. Um, whilst you're out on the road, but on a gravel bike, you're a lot more dynamic and you're turning the handlebars more. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so I would all, what, what Rosie and I do on our gravel bikes is uh, we put an Apidura bike bag, which is 100% waterproof, onto the seat post of our bike. Yeah. That acts as the rear mud guard yeah. and also the carrier for snacks, small lock, Got to feed him. Got to he's, feed, he's, yeah. He's got to feed it, food. and also, um, <laughs> and also, uh, spare clothes. Mm -hmm. So you put that in. So, so that rear bike bag acts as a uh, as a rear mud guard, also as a as a as a carrier, and then the front you just go. It is what it is. 
Yeah. 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 Um, whereas if you're specifically wanting a winter bike, for example, for doing club rides or road riding, then a f- you can't be a full length mudguard, a, a yeah. proper fitted full length mudguard yeah, yeah. front and rear. And that really does keep the worst of, yeah. of the weather off you. I, I actually quite like the look of a road bike with mudguards on you. Well, we have. <laughs> I uh, think yeah, it looks really cool. It looks amazing. We actually had a guy, um, and you know, if you're listening, John, I salute your choice. Um, he bought a Trek Demane SL5, so full carbon fiber frame Trek Demane with a Shimano 105 transmission, so not expensive to maintain over winter use, and we're, we're going to unpack that in a bit as well uh, but with a beautiful sl5 carbon frame full length fitted mud guards but he's 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 a pretty good road rider so he actually had it quite a long stem quite aggressively set up it looked amazing and it was in this crystal white color but with gloss black mud guards so it actually looked like your rs3 yeah 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 um, Very cool. It looked absolutely incredible. He picked that up last week, so that that was that was really nice. So I, I agree with you. A, a, a proper setup yeah. winter bike yeah. can look really quite cool. Yeah. So okay, so that's my guard. Okay, we've talked about lights before. I'm going to just say, have some decent lights, people. Yes. Spend some money on some decent lights yeah. because obviously, at not even during the day, the sun's lower in the sky. You know, you just want to be visible. So yeah. we've kind of done a podcast on on lights. Go out and buy the most, most the, the the most money you can spend on lights. Basically. Yeah, one thing to bear in mind on the lights, which we didn't cover in the lights podcast, which mm-hmm. is relevant for for this, is also bear in mind that a lot of the cost of lights is not only in the LEDs but also in the battery. So you spend a lot more on lights if it's got a bigger capacity battery. Don't forget that batteries. <laughs> so, so the dog has now brought a squeaky toy, <laughs> which could completely uh, annihilate. Ali, we're recording a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Hello, I know, Dars. What are you? What is she like? Yes. Yeah. Um, so bear in mind that um, winter use or cold weather use does deplete batteries yeah. faster. Uh, than in warmer weather. Yeah. So do bear in mind that you don't just want a light that's got a, a claimed hour and a half or three hour um, run time. You've got to, I, mean, I don't know how far you'd take off that. You might want to say, I need a third on top in yeah, in know. reserves. It depends. You live up north, it's really cold. It's there. really cold yeah. up there, yes. <laughs> so. We are sorry, everybody. The dog is going <laughs> mental. <laughs> uh, never work with children or animals. So, um, okay. So, next question, then. Yes. I kind of know where this is going to go. Yeah. Tires. Tires. Yes. All right. So, I, I'm I'm learning the error of my ways. So, I would have always, in the past, stuck on a set of armored tires with a tread on them for winter. Okay. Well, no, that's not error of ways. So what you've got to bear in mind is when when you're riding um, in the winter, you've got more rain that basically pushes grit and gravel from the roadside yeah. um, and the road verges onto the road. Yeah. So, so the tyre does have to be more abrasion resistant to those small chippings yeah. compared to in the summer. So when we talk about armored tires, they, they tend to have a little bit more resilient, uh, a little bit more resilience from things like stone chippings and what have you tearing the tires. So that's not a daft thing. Uh, the other thing as well is, is um, it's not just about tread. So always remember, and it, this, is, this is from my BMW days, I can really deep dive winter tires and get very nerdy on winter tires. Me too. Yes, Having indeed. just been yes. in Austria driving very yes. fast in the winter. So what a lot of people don't realise about a tyre is the tread on a tyre on a mountain bike is either to search through the mud to find the hard stuff underneath for it to grip, but a... A sipe or the, the, the tread that's cut into a road tyre is purely there to evacuate water, 
yeah, for the for the actual rubber compound itself to then go into the ground. But the thing that people don't realize is that when you get to seven degrees and below, a standard summer base tire actually starts to get brittle. Yeah. Okay, so the compound itself starts to get stiffer and more brittle. And that is why it doesn't grip as much um, on a cold, wet road surface mm -hmm. because the actual rubber compound itself can't, can't dig into the tarmac. So whenever you see a tyre, and um, Continental make them, uh, we do a Michelin all-season tyre, and they have a high silica compound um, as opposed to a high rubber compound. So they still stay malleable from seven degrees and below. Yep. So that, that is what gives you your grip in the winter. You can then talk about full winter tires that then actually attract the snow to sit into the tread block. Because, and the, the analogy that I always gave when I was at BMW, if you imagine, um, uh, rolling a snowball in your bare hands, that snowball would basically melt against the heat of your hands and just start slipping in your hands. So a tire slipping on snow is actually aquaplaning. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's it, it's just the water level in between. Then imagine putting a set of woolly mitts on, picking up the same snowball and basically you feel the grip, and that's because the snow crystals basically grip against the snow that's on the glove. Yeah. And that's how a winter tyre works. It's designed to collect the snow in the sipes, and it's the snow on snow that gives you the grip. And that is the most uh, counterintuitive thing. Indeed. I mean, it's exactly the same thing with car tyres, by the way. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah car, car tyres and bike tyres. Um, are the same so and maybe most uh, uh, you know yeah a lot of the guys listening will be maybe more comfortable with the winter tire concept on a car yeah but it's exactly the same on the bike it's exactly the same on the bike so keith um my sort of right hand man at criterium in um and he'll he'll be putting them on now because we're getting to that time of year will fit his continental winter top contact tires to his um uh, to his uh, commuter bike and genuinely in the near eight years that Keith and I have worked together he has ridden in winter and never missed a day's work and he rides in deep snow on that commuter bike using those tires overtaking people who are in cars who are stuck yeah yeah yeah. So, um, whereas on a road bike um, that's not going to be ridden in snow, but on cold, wet roads, you are always worth, if that's where you're going to be riding, you're always worth putting a set of all-season tyres. Again, Continental make the um, the all-season, uh, what do they call it? Four uh, the four-season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they call it the four-season and Michelin call it the all-season. Yeah. And, and they are a high silica compound. Yeah. So they make a massive difference yeah. to the grip and confidence that you get when riding your bike in the winter. Yeah. So, okay, so we've done mud guards, tyres. Yeah. Oh, I've got another question. I've just, just actually, it, it, it probably is a, a, an interesting one. Uh, and it's actually come from one of the previous episodes of Cycle Sunday, but it's a winter thing. Yeah. A few people commented about the old train and asked if I was going to get it PPF'd, paint protection film. Yeah, yeah, and I, and and uh, my 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 one of my answers to that is well, I'm never going to ride it in the rain, so it should be okay. But but in, just in terms of protecting your bike frame and all the other components from that kind of road grind, yeah, it, is there anything else you would do on top of your normal kind of just normal cleaning routine? This is the key thing. So all. PPF will, oh, sorry, yes, that's the <laughs> other one now wanting uh, my attention. Um, so the, 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 the key thing when it comes to winter riding is PPF or any form of paint protection film, whether it's Invisiframe or some 3M heli tape or something yeah. like that, 
they help against scrapes, scratches and stone chips. So if you were going to do anything on the old tray, it may be a strip down the down tube of the bike yeah. just to help protect the paint on the down tube from stone chips coming off the tire. Yeah. Maybe a bit on the chain stay and seat stay just in case your heels rub the paint. And then maybe just a bit on the top tube when you stand over the top tube um, of the bike just just to stop um, uh, scratching the, the, the paint on the top tube. But to be honest with you, I've never PPF'd a, um, a, a summer road bike, no. ever. But We it, worked really hard to make it light, then we're going to put a whole bunch of heavy film on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's one of those things, if, 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 you, if you know you're going to be using the bike and you just do not want any chips on it whatsoever and you want to keep this thing looking as new as possible and you're not bothered about an extra 100 grams of weight, fill your boots. Yeah. I don't think but no, 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 no. But in the winter, the key thing that is going to kill your bike is salt. Yeah. And it, it's not just riding your bike out in the winter and the salt that's on the road that you have to consider, but it's also your bike on your turbo trainer as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. So don't forget that every bit of sweat that you drip onto your bike is full of sodium. Yeah. And if you don't wipe it off and clean it, you will corrode your headset, bolts, frame, drivetrain really quickly. So when I was doing my turbo training uh, for all those months with uh, when doing the Marmot, we actually, uh, when I say we, Rosie and I, we have big high powered 18 inch fans that basically cleared um, as much of the moisture as possible. But we also set up a dehumidifier for afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we just pulled all of that um, moisture out. So wow, that, I yeah. must have had to work hardcore after you've been on a bike. Very <laughs> much, <laughs> <laughs> very much. Um, but then we also... Industrial strength. Industrial strength, yeah, yeah. But then we also made sure that we uh, wiped it down with the damp cloth um, um, of fresh water as well. Did you use a sweat thong? No. No. I've got a sweat thong on my bike. Yeah. Does that work? I mean, I've, I've never... Well, yeah, because, well, the main... So, for those of you who don't know what a sweat thong is, <laughs> so it's like a triangular-shaped thing. It's got a, a elastic that goes around the seat post and then two bits of Velcro that go around the handlebars. Yeah. And it basically just creates this thing that, that protects your top tube and all your headset and stuff. And it just your sweat just drops onto that and then you just stick it in the washing machine every couple of, couple of days. Yeah, but doesn't it stay moist? Well, well, so do you not if you don't take it off immediately? Yeah, does is that uh, not, would, how, how much do you sweat? Mate? Oh, like we've never we've never ridden together. You will find out. No, oh, so horrendous. Um, no, but, but I mean, I, I wash it every couple of weeks. Okay. But no, it just it just stops the drips, and then I, I, what I normally have is that comes down my elbows and, <laughs> on my hands, and then off the off the side of the handlebars is yes. two big pools of water that yes. yeah, so they get mopped up. Yes, um, I normally have a towel underneath the bike when I'm riding. Anyway. Yeah, um, but that's a good one actually, just in terms of, of just general corrosion. Yeah. And then I guess the other thing is just keep your drivetrain clean, right? Definitely. So the key thing is is that when you get if you've been out for a winter ride. It is so tempting because you'll be cold, you'll be tired, and all you'll want to do is get in the house. I know what's coming. Yeah. Um, you'll just want to get in the house, you want to get a cup of tea, you want to get into the shower, and then you go, I'll sort my bike out later. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. You have to clean the bike immediately. Yeah. Whilst that salt water that you've just picked up on your bike is still on the surface of everything it's not dried and started to eat get a hose pipe on it get some bike wash and get that salt off straight away rule number one about winter riding yeah because i i i'm very good at that because i know what will happen if i think oh i'm going to have a shower and get warm first you know go back out again ever 
Um, so no, I, I will even if I'm even if I'm freezing cold or knackered, it takes five minutes. It does. It's five minutes. Yeah. And also, uh, especially if you're in mountain biking, the the when the mud's still wet. Yeah. You, you often don't even need pipe wash. A bit of you know, high pressure hose pipe yes. or, or a low pressure jet wash. Yes. And and off off it comes and yes. it's clean. Yes, indeed. So um, so that that's kind of rule number yeah, one. And then it, what I normally do is I'll clean the pipe and then I'll start washing my legs and uh, I'll normally yes. wear overshoes on, wash them off, and then yeah, yeah. I get into the boot room and normally there's a dressing gown in the boot room and really? I just take all your clothes off. Get in your dressing gown and get on a shower. When when Rosie and I had our um, uh, kitchen done, yeah. um, and they were reconnecting under the sink to the outside tap, uh, we got them to connect the outside tap to the hot water. Oh, mate, that's luxury. It's amazing. So we we jet, <laughs> yeah, so the hose pipe never freezes. Yeah, um, and and basically you're washing the bike with warm water. And it's just lovely on your cold hands and you can just literally with warm water, just literally wash your legs down, wash yeah. your overshoes. I tell you, you're saying it's luxury. You're now going, why the heck did I not think of that? Uh, I am. Right. I actually, yeah. When we do the barn, I think that's definitely a, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely a thing. Yes. Yeah, how long have we been going anyway? I can't read that. <laughs> 36 minutes. Oh. Blimey! <laughs> <laughs> We're both blind. We can't see. We need another gin and tonic. Oh, right. Okay. Well, pause it. Should we pause? Hold on. Ready? Just pause. One moment. Stay there, girls. Dude. Oh, you can stay there, dude. Yes. Because you're being good. You're nice and quiet. No. Why are you bringing toys all the time? <laughs> For those of you listening, <laughs> one of my dogs is being very demanding. Yes. This is good. I'm just quick, quick nip over to the kitchen, get another gin and tonic. It's very, very good indeed. Yeah. Yes, Cheers, mate. Yes, we well done. Do, we should Cheers. do this in person more often. We should. Yes, it's a little bit of a long way, but uh, it's I was going to say, yes, only 400 mile journey, big wuss. Yes. So, okay, so uh, um, uh, we've done um, tires and lights and uh, cleaning and um, mud guards. Um, what about um, just in terms of so, if you're going to be what? <laughs> if you're going to be using your gravel bike a bit more in the winter as a winter bike, yeah, arguably maybe, yeah, you're going to be spending a bit more time on the road than you might have done in summer, maybe. Uh, not necessarily, because a lot of the routes that you would do on your gravel bike in the summer, yeah, actually just become more fun. And a little bit more challenging yeah. in the winter. Have you ever ridden on South Downs Chalk? Oh no, what's that like, mate? What is it slippy or is it like slippy? <laughs> it's like PTFE, mate. It's it's really horrific. Okay. Yeah, it's bad in the. So there's quite a well, the downs are chalk based anyway. So right. what you end up you, you get in the summer, you get a path that well, two things happen. Firstly. When, when when it rains hard and there's like a rain or, or water comes down the path, you get these little gullies and channels that right, are okay. kind of eroded into the path. Yeah. So um, you, you end up with, in some cases, quite quite big kind of Vs in the yes. in the path. And and the challenge is when you're, especially when you're going quickly down downhill, um, is working out how you're going to cross them. So because so, sometimes it might go, you, you can't stay on one side, so you have to kind of you yes. can't go. You have to go across them at a, a, a big enough angle so you don't lose your front wheel. Yes. Um, and that's the same going uphill or downhill. Right. So that's the first thing is you get a lot of these kind of ravines almost in, in paths. Right. Um, but the biggest one is the sides of those are normally bare chalk. So you'll have a lot of the paths have got that chalk with like a gravel top on them. Okay. But, but where, where it's eroded away because of the water, it, that gravel gets washed away, and what you end up with is bare chalk oh, underneath. Yeah. Now, in the dry, it's not too bad, but when it's wet, right, it is lethal, right. like really lethal. It's like slate in the Lake District. Yeah. That's a similar thing, probably. Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I know when I first I got my mountain bike, I I rode it about four or five times, and I went to the bike shop, my local shop, and just looked. 
I, I'm, I've got the wrong tires on here. Okay. Um, because they, they just didn't have the right the right sort of block size and all that kind of stuff. Yes. So so I I changed my tires specifically for this kind of chalky type stuff. Right. So that might you know, but, but like, on a that on a, might be a thing is 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 actually the entire choice. Yeah. On, yeah. on a on a gravel bike. Um. Well, on any bike, it, it, the, the danger is you lose the front wheel. Yes. Um, and, um, and, you know, what happens then? It, it, it happens very quickly and you normally end up breaking your collarbone. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't want that to happen. So, so yeah, no, the, the, the chalky downs, but that's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. It's, it can be really slippery. Yeah. Um, so, no, so um, so what about in terms of gearing and stuff? So, my, uh, the gravel, the, the Archidex that, that we saw in the film tonight is a one-by drivetrain, so just a single yeah. chain ring at the front. But yeah. I guess you can put maybe like a compact type setup you on can. a gravel bike if you wanted to, or you, you can you have so, it slightly lower geared than that. Yeah, so so you've got you've got two choices really on gravel bikes. Uh, some manufacturers they just specifically do one by because they are, and when we say one by, just single chainring on the front and then your cluster of gears on the back. And if you are going to be using your gravel bike predominantly for off road use, where all you need is an ultimate first gear to get to the top of the hill and then gravity is basically leading you on the way back down again. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for one bys because uh, it does eliminate the front derailleur, which can be a weak point, particularly in winter oh, use. It just clogs up with yeah, mud. Yeah, clogs up with mud. Because and... we, we get lots of clay around here as well. Oh, flip it. You need to move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Walking clay. <laughs> Chalking <Sorry. on. laughs> um, So... Um, but the, the disadvantage to a one by is that you you are always compromising on gear ratios. Yeah, yeah. And you can say what you like in the comments. This is fact. You either have a small front chain ring, yeah, and then enough gears, a, a tight rear cassette, yeah so that you get a reasonable cadence yeah so you don't have too big a jumps between gears but then you ultimately lose out on top end speed or you have a bigger front chain ring and then a larger cassette on the back so a larger range cassette but then the steps in between the gears are now getting bigger which is going to affect cadence yeah or a large front chain ring with a tightly grouped rear cassette and you're going to lose out on on your uh, granny gear on your on yeah. your ultimate first gear so when you've got a maximum choice of i mean okay campag has re, um as as uh, launched their new ekar range which is a 13 speed 13 13 speed Mate, I, I, look, when i was a kid if you got a race, you had like five speed. Five right? speed. And yeah, that was yeah. like, wow. Yes. Yeah. 13. 13 speed. So so with the ECAR system, wow. they are doing their level best to try and keep that ultimate high gear with an ultimate first gear and try and keep uh, the, the, the cadence aspect as, as close as possible. Yeah. But of course, there's a cost to that. Yeah. Right. So, and the, and the problem is, do you then want to run an expensive drivetrain yeah. in the winter <sighs> in the salt? No, not really. Right? So, it then... <laughs> Super record EPS Super... on my old train. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so, then you come back to, well, what is a winter bike? Well, a winter bike is something that shouldn't really cost a lot of money to buy. But it certainly shouldn't cost a lot of money to run. Yeah. So you then want to be looking at lower spec, lower speed drivetrains. Yeah. So the bike that I've just delivered today to uh, to the gentleman was a Trek Demane AL series of bike, and those bikes are around twelve hundred quid to sixteen hundred quid. They have a threaded outboard shell bottom bracket so when the bottom bracket bearings are destroyed 25 quid later you've got a new bottom bracket fitted to it excellent they either have pretty much a nine speed or a ten speed drivetrain from shimano sora or tiagra so 
15 to 20 quid for a chain. So if you do forget to clean your chain and you go back to it a week later and it's red rusty, yeah. you go, oh, won't do that again, but it's only going to cost me 15 to 20 quid to yeah, rectify yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but those, because you're dealing with nine and 10 speed uh, gear ranges, they are optimized to run on a two by front end. And that gives you your range to get from your low gears up to your high gears. So, so that's your benefit of a two by system. It will give you a lower cost transmission because mm. it's less sexy. It's, it, it's come from old technologies or yeah. tech or not old technology, but technology that has been used for decades. Yeah and gives you a massive range of low gears up to a good range of high gears for very inexpensive prices yeah. to buy and run. Yeah. So you've got all of those benefits to a two buy, but the downside is you then need to absolutely make sure that you keep on top of the cleaning and the maintenance uh, because that front derailleur has got very small pins that if they do get corroded, they do cause an issue in terms of shifting. Mm. So yeah, a one buy, great. If you can get the gear range, absolutely spot on for you. You've got the budget to buy it and you've got the budget to run it. If you don't, and you're just wanting something to get out, get a two buy system. Question. Yes. What happened to triple chain rings? Because I remember it wasn't that many years ago, my first decent costing mountain bike, Yeah. Uh, I can remember it cost me 600 quid, which, but we're talking like 1994, mm -hmm. 95. Yeah. I had a triple chain ring at the yeah. front yeah. with a massive range of gears. Yes. And then, cool. uh, and then I even remember actually Dino um, um, had a triple chain ring on a Trek um, road bike. Yes. Yes. And then suddenly they, was it a fashion thing or just a nope. complexity thing or did just, you don't see bikes with triples anymore? Yeah. And I know we used to go <laughs> when we did the tour. Um, we, we had a, a, a probably not particularly politically correct statement, but triples are for cripples. <laughs> no, so I'm not so sure that's <clears throat> probably a you know. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, so when it comes to triples, what you said about five ten minutes ago was absolutely apt. You got to remember where we started from. So originally we started, and when I started riding. Um, bikes back in the sort of early 80s, late 80s, or mid 80s, really. A road bike had two cogs on the front and it had five on the back. Yeah. Okay. And 10 speed racer. 10 speed racer. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 all, <laughs> we all wanted a rally banana, <laughs> yeah, you know, 10 speed and friction gears and yeah, yeah. Th didn't have didn't have indexing kids we no, <laughs> you had to feel your way yeah. for it rim brakes rim brakes but but what you've got to bear in mind is is that your big steps in gear ratios happen at the front end of the bike and the fine tuning of that ratio for cadence happens at the back end of the bike yeah right so if you keep with that principle for a second so you say that a triple had massive range, actually didn't. It had a ton of overlapping ratios. Ah. So you, so if you think about your smallest chain ring yeah. and your largest rear cassette sprocket yeah. and what ratio that delivered, and then look at your outermost chain ring, so your big chain ring and your smallest cog at the back, is your ultimate top end, you'll prop on a three by seven or a three by eight drivetrain, you'll probably find that your two by 12 has got the same ultra or better ultimate first gear with as high top gear, but very few overlapping ratios yeah, yeah. because we now have more cogs. We've moved from seven or eight speed yeah. to 12. Yeah, yeah, so you don't need it. So you don't need it. So that's been the demise of the three bikers. Oh, flip. Even the best technicians in the world, a triple on 
never shifts right. And, and feel free to leave whatever you like <laughs> in the comments. And cross-chaining. Uh, oh. Cross-chaining, uh, just the noise. You always get derailleur rub. You always get all that sort of stuff. And then they clog. Uh, oh, so, <laughs> so, it, 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 and, and, and the thing is, is that on a mountain bike, a triple setup, the outer chain ring basically was just a glorified uh, bash guard, mm. right? That just protected your middle and your inner chain ring anyway, who actually used it. And because riding's changed now that, you know, when you go to a trail center, all you need is a first gear to get up to the top and then gravity leads its way back down again. Yeah. A single chain ring on a mountain bike gives you more rollover clearance because it's a smaller chain ring. It allows the manufacturers to give a lower bottom bracket that reduces the center of gravity of the rider that gives more stability and better over jumps and bumps. Um, and from a packaging perspective, we can now run a single chain ring on a mountain bike, keep the chain stay length short, the width of the chain stay and the seat stay wide. So we can now put a 29 inch wheel with a 2.6 inch tire and 150 millimeter suspension in a chain stay length that was akin to what you used to put on a 26 inch wheel because they had to have packaging room for the three chain rings. They don't have to consider the chain rings now, the width of the chain rings on that chain set as a packaging restriction every day is a school day with you mate well it, it makes sense when you think about <laughs> I it know, but i know but you know i ask a simple question like well, where's triple gone and you don't go well we've got rid of them because we're rubbish you kind of yeah you're like <laughs> a walking encyclopedia of bikes I, but i do that jo that's my job <laughs> if we started to talk about Telecoms. Yeah, I'd bore the crap out of people. Yeah, but <laughs> but you know what you're talking about because it's it's the industry that you've been in. Yeah, don't yeah. forget, I've been riding bikes for 30 years. Yeah. I know, I don't look that old. You started riding a bike when you were 10. Yeah, well done. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Boys. yeah. <laughs> so I've been riding bikes for 30 25. years, but I've, I've been in the industry as in physically my day job seven days a week for eight years yeah, yeah. yeah and the thing is is that you know i'd hope that i was a reasonable knowledge base for people <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah, but, the, but the difference is is the fact that i do have that 30 years before i open the bike shop yeah so my i you know my first mountain bike my first race bike suspension and disc brakes hadn't even been invented yet did it have round wheels or were they still square at that time it had round wheels yeah. and of equal size as well you cheeky muck yeah, yeah there, there wasn't a big one at the front and a little one at the back <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what there's a guy near here yeah and he rides a penny farthing really right? but he's the coolest guy ever because he's he, when he goes out and you only see him in the in the summertime but he's got this beautiful penny farthing, right? And he's got all the gear. So he's in his kind of, you know, plus four, big long socks, lovely brogue shoes. That's he's got this big handlebar moustache, deer stalker hat. He's just cool as. And you see him, right? And it's a beautiful bike. It's got this lovely kind of brown leather yes. um, uh, little satchel on the front handlebars. Oh. And it's amazing, amazing thing. And he's, But yeah, he just rides around on a penny farthing. <laughs> what, what a dude. Because there was a... Um... Because the repair shop is yeah. shot near here. It's three miles now. It's three miles. So the repair shop, which is the other reason why Rosie really wants to come down, because she actually wants to see the repair shop. Right. Okay. Place. It's literally. Yeah. Uh, yes. Just that. Um, yeah. So, so the repair shop's three miles away, as we've just found out. My perfect TV job, by the way, if people see you watching. Oh, yeah. right. I'd love to love to work on the repair shop. Yeah. It's, it's really good. I can't actually do any repairs, but it would be because it would be like three miles away. Well, that would be the Whereas vintage thing. voltage is four and a half hours away oh, in right. Wales. <laughs> Repair shops, three miles away. Yeah. Anyway, so they, re they restored a penny farthing mm -hmm. on the repair shop, and a guy 
the the guy who repaired it, he rides penny farthings. I'm wondering, is it that person? It, it, it might be. I don't know. Yeah. I've just seen him out on on it a couple of times. Right. right there. Very cool. It was very cool. That's cool. And then I, I'm really digressing in it, but when I did the dragon ride, which was a long time ago now, there was a guy did the dragon ride on a, on a unicycle. On no. one of the have you seen the road bike unicycles with the drop bars and stuff? No. Oh, mate, they're amazing. They're like, the, the, the wheel's huge. Right. And they've got, like, aero bars on them. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, honestly, I'll show you a picture afterwards. Uh, it's it, They're wicked. But, yeah, and they did it did a, did the, the Dragon Ride on a unicycle. Just absolute hero. A total hero. It's <laughs> <laughs> on my front two wheels. Total hero. That, that is absolutely incredible. Where are we now in the uh, podcast uh, 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 agenda? <laughs> yes. Uh, so so we've covered all the gear ratios. We're, we're two gin and tonics in. We're two gin and tonics in. G, G and tonic. Yeah. That's a and new and also, gin. This thing. is gin and tonic I bought when I did the North Coast 500 from John O'Groats. So it's actually Scottish gin, especially for you because you come all the way down from Scotland. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased. Hmm. So ultimately, that's what it's actually quite a nice segue from me talking about my sort of 80s, 90s mountain bike yeah. that didn't have suspension, didn't have disc brakes is not actually far off what a gravel bike is today. Yeah. So my... It just needs cow horns. It just, yeah, yeah, it just needs bull, bull bars on the end. But my um, my gravel bike probably has got more off-road capability than my first race mountain bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it really has come full circle. And, and the thing I absolutely love about my gravel bike is the fact that it actually makes me feel like a kid again. Yeah. You just go off and ride your bike. Yeah. You sometimes don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're going to do. Yeah. You just go, I'm going to go out for a couple of hours and see where yeah. the bike takes me almost. Yeah. And I get that with my e-bike as well. Do you? Because the nice thing about e-bike, you can do that. I'm going to go and see where it takes me and not be worried that you're going to come up against this massive hill that you have to push your bike up. Yes. Because on an e-bike, you don't need to worry about that. You don't. But no, I, you, you, I, I, I remember when you were saying about your e-bike that it just was like riding your bike as a kid. And, you know, yeah. I can remember. Excuse me. Yes. We've, we've now got another squeaky toy, which is actually a flat squirrel. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, Bob's, what are you doing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to have to do this as a thumbnail uh, so people can actually understand. In fact, I'm going to, you carry on talking, Pete, and I'm going, to, I'm going to take a photo just so people can actually understand what is going on here. So, yeah, if, you, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll put it up now. Yeah. Um, if you're not, then just pop onto uh, uh, the, the uh, Criterium Cycles um instagram account or my instagram account we'll put it up there yes um, uh, so <laughs> we hope everybody's enjoyed this <laughs> you've been really good up see the dark darcy she's the older one she's, yes she's, i know yes i know and 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 next week in fact actually we might even record a couple while we're down here yeah we're gonna um, do one tomorrow we're gonna do one tomorrow but then after that normal we'll, we'll just we'll do it seriously again <laughs> But I hope everybody's enjoyed this because we certainly have. We have, this we been... have. I can't read the time. How long have we been going? Nearly an hour. Oh, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Guys, first of all, it, uh, Paul and I spend a lot of time um, in the planning and running of Cycle Sunday um, on the opposite end of a Zoom call or a WhatsApp call or a, or a you know an email. And and it, you know when we actually physically get together. We really love it. It's yeah. actually only the fourth time we've been physically together. I know. It's crazy. Which is really, it? really weird because yes. we spend so much time talking to each other. So when Paul was coming down and, and you know, we, we've got a, a couple of things planned we, we're going to um, – uh, with the bikes. And um, unfortunately, the really gutting thing, and it is really gutting, is – I said to Paul, why don't you bring your bike down? We'll go for a bike ride tomorrow. And unfortunately, he had so many bikes to be delivered. <laughs> the van was he, he couldn't fit his bike in. Yes. And unfortunately, my bikes look like five bar gates, so there's no way he's going to be able to ride one of them. So uh, we'll just go for a walk in the morning and then yes. we'll record another podcast. But guys, I hope you've enjoyed that one. We've certainly enjoyed recording it. And yeah. as I said, gravel bikes and, and winter bikes, um, hopefully you've, you've learned a little bit. We always like to try and, you know, every day is a school day yes. with the Balkans. Yes. Um, hello. 
Yes. yes. Um, and obviously, for those of you watching, yeah. if you're not, if you're listening to this, by the way, on, on Apple or Spotify or Amazon or whatever, you need to go over to the YouTube channel and watch it because it's been brilliant. It, it, the dogs. It, it's been we, we've <laughs> comedy value. It's a, there has been comedy value from the dogs. But also, the, the reason why I was so taken aback with the gin and tonics was I genuinely didn't expect flashing lights flashing you not lights. had flashing lights in your gin and tonic. i never had a flashing light in my gin and tonic uh, but do you know the other thing about a second ago um I, I, I took a swig of my gin and tonic and the ice had melted yeah and a bit went into my mouth and i was worried it might be an led <laughs> <laughs> so on that bombshell, uh, yeah. we're going to go and get another um, another gin and tonic. And um, we're going to go on your racing sim now. He wants to have a go on the sim now. Oh, yeah. Really excited. So anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. At this point, I always say I've been Pete Greaves. And I've been Paul Bowker. <laughs> you ride safe, guys. Ride safe, everybody. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.